I'm heartily sick of my situation. And with reason. Mm -hmm. But tis in a great measure your own fault. <gasps> Here is this Mr. Eustace, a man of character and family. He likes you. You like him. You know one another's minds, and yet you will not resolve to make yourself happy with him. <laughs>
inclinations or allowing you a negative in case he should not prove agreeable. Why, I should think it a little hard, yet when I see you in the character of a chambermaid. It is the only character, my dear, in which I could hope to lie concealed. I can tell you I was reduced to the last extremity when, in consequence of our old boarding school friendship, I applied to you to receive me in this capacity, for we expected the parties the very next week. But had you not a message from your intended spouse to let you know he was as little, in little inclined to, to such ill-concerted nuptials as you were? More than so, he wrote to me to contrive some method of breaking them off, for he had rather return to his dear studies at Oxford, and... After that, what hopes could I have of being happy with him? Then you are not at all uneasy at the strange route you must have occasioned at home. I warrant during this month you've been absent. Oh, don't mention it, my dear. I have had so many admirers since I commenced Abigail. I'm quite charmed with my situation. But hold! Who stalks yonder into the yard that the dogs are so glad to see? Daddy Hawthorne, as I live! He's come to pay my father a visit, and never more luckily, for he always forces him abroad. <laughs> By the way, what will you do with yourself while I go into the house to see after my trusty messenger, Hodge? No matter. I'll sit down by that arbor and listen to the singing of the birds. I'm quite fond of melancholy amusements. So it seems indeed. Sure, Rosetta, none of your admirers have made a hole in your heart. You're not in love, I hope. In love? That's pleasant. Who do you suppose I should be in love with, pray? Why, let me think. How about Thomas the gardener? There he is at the other end of the walk. He's a very pretty young man, and the servants say he's always writing verses on you. <laughs> Indeed, Lucinda, you are very silly. Indeed, Rosanna, the blush makes you look very handsome. Blush, I am sure I do. <laughs> blush! Pshaw, <laughs> sure, Lucinda, how can you be so ridiculous? Don't be angry, and I have done. But say you did like him. How could you help yourself? <laughs> June, at half an hour past five in the morning, I left my father's house unknown to anyone, having made free with a coat and jacket of our garters, which fitted me by way of a disguise. So says my pocketbook. And chance directing me to this village, on the 20th of the same month, I procured the recommendation of the worshipful Justice Woodcock to be the superintendent of his pumpkins and cabbages. <laughs> For I would let my father see that I would run any lengths rather than submit to what his obstinacy would have forced me. A marriage against my inclination with a woman I never saw. <sighs> Here I have been three weeks, and in that time I am as much altered as if I had changed my nature with my habit. It's death to fall in love with a chambermaid. And yet... If I could forget that I am the son and heir of Sir William Meadows. But that's impossible. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. 
Here she comes. <laughs> Lucinda was certainly in the right of it, and yet I blushed to own my weakness even to myself. Mary, hang the man for not being a gentleman. I am determined I won't speak to her. Now or never is the time to conquer myself. Besides, I have some reason to believe that the girl has some interest in me. As I wish not to do her an injury, it would be cruel of me to fill her head with notions of what can never happen. Pshaw, <laughs> rock these roses and they prick one's fingers. He takes no notice of me, but so much the better, I'll be as indifferent as he is. I am sure the poor lad likes me, and if I was to give him any encouragement, I suppose the next thing he talked of would be buying a ring and being asked in church. Dear Pride, I thank you for that thought. Huh. Going without a word. A look. I can't bear that. Mistress Rosetta, I am gathering a few roses here, if you'll please to take them in with you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, but my lady's flower pots are all full. Well, will you accept them for yourself, then? What's the matter? You look as if you were angry with me. Pray let go my hand. Nay, prithee, why is this? You shan't go. I have something to say to you. Oh, but I must go. I, I, I will go. I desire, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> is a riddle. That she loves me, I feel there is no room to doubt. She takes a thousand opportunities to let me see it. And yet, when I speak to her, she will hardly give me an answer. And if I attempt the smallest familiarity, it is gone in an instant. I feel my passion for her grow every day more and more violent. Well, would I marry her? Would I make a mistress of her if I could? Two things called prudence and honor forbid either. What am I pursuing then? A shadow! Sure, my evil genius laid this snare in my way. However, there is one comfort. It is in my power to fly from it. If so, why do I hesitate? I am distracted, unable to determine anything. <laughs> Still in hope to get the better of my stubborn flame and try. 
I swear this moment to forget her. Then the next, my oath deny, my oath deny, my oath deny. Now prepared with scorn to treat and bear every charm in heart I brave, every charm in heart I brave. of it by this time, but you've got that lazy, unwholesome London fashion of lying abed in the morning, and there's gout for you. Why, I have not been in bed five minutes after sunrise these 30 years, and generally up before it, and I never took a dose of physic but once in my life, and that was in compliment to a cousin of mine, an apothecary that had just set up business. Oh, well, Master Hawthorne, let me tell you, you know nothing of the matter, for I say sleep is necessary for a man, and I'll maintain it. <laughs> and I maintain the contrary. Look you, neighbor Woodcock, you are a rich man, a man of worship, a justice of peace, and all that. But learn to know the respect that is due from the sound of the infirm, and allow me the superiority a good constitution gives me over you. Health is the greatest of all possessions, and tis a maxim with me that an hale cobbler is a better man than a sick king. Oh, well, you are a sportsman. And so would you too, if you would follow my advice. A sportsman? Kofa! Why, there is nothing like it. I would not exchange the satisfaction I feel while beating the lawns and thickets about my little farm for all the entertainments and pageantry in Christendom. <laughs> Oh, 
cold, sir. Cold, sir? Where have you and the rest of those rascals been, huh? But I suppose I need not ask. You must know there's a statute, a fair for hiring servants, of hell upon my green today. We have it usually at the season of the year, and it never fails to put all the folks here about out of their senses. Lord, Your Honor, look out and see what a nice show they make yonder. Uh, They've got pipers and fiddlers uh, who are dancing as I come along for dear life. I never saw such a mortal throng in our village in all my born days again. Well, this is something. This is more like it. Uh, no, no, it is a very foolish business. Good for nothing but to promote idleness in the getting of bastards. But I shall take measure for preventing it another year, and I doubt whether I am not sufficiently authorized enough already. For by an act which empowers a justice of peace, who is the law of the manor. Come, come, never mind the act. Let me tell you, this is a very proper, a very useful meeting. I want a servant or two myself. I must go see what your market affords. And you shall go, and the girls, my little Lucy, and the other young rogue, and we'll make a day on it, as well as the rest. Oh, I wish, Master Hawthorne, I could teach you to be a little bit more sedate. Why don't you take pattern by me and consider your dignity? Oh, it's hard. I don't wonder you are not a rich man. You laugh too much ever to be rich. <laughs> right, never woodcock. Health, good humor, and competence is my motto. And if my executors have a mind, they're welcome to make it my epitaph. The honest heart whose thoughts are clear from fraud, discovers and blood, need neither fortune's crown in fear, nor call the heart's mind. The greatness that would make us great is but an empty, empty thing. What more than mirth would mortals have? Good more than that, good mortals have. The cheerful, cheerful man, the king, the cheerful man. never knew anything for her so crossly in your born days. Why? What's the matter? Why? You know why I dare not take a horse out of his warship's stables this morning, for fear it should be missed in breed questions. And our old nag at home was so cruelly bitteth the hoofs that poor beast it had not a foot to set to ground. So I was fain to go to Farmer Plowshares at the Grange to borrow the loan of his bald filly, and would you think it, after walking all that way, deal from me if the cross-grained toad denied me the failure. Unlucky! Well, then I went to the King's Head in the village, but all their cattle were at plough, and I was as far to seek below at the turnpike. So, for want of a better, I was forced to take up with Dame Quixit's blind mare. Oh, then you have been. Yes. Yes, I have been. Why didn't you say so at once? Aye, but I have had a main tiresome jaunt on it, for she is a sorry jade. Well, well, did you see Mr. Eustace? And what did he say to you? Come quick, have you ere a letter? Oh, yes, he gave me a letter, if I had not lost it. Lost it? Man! Hey, oh. hey, have a bit of patience. Odd oh, ones, you're always in such a rush. Oh, i put it here somewhere. Oh. Here it is. So give it me! <gasps> Lord of mercy, how my arm aches from beating that plaguey beast. I'll be hanged if I want a rather a thrashed up a day than a ridden her. Well, Hodge, you have done your business very well. Well, have I not now? Yes! Mr. Eustace tells me in this letter that he will be in the green lane at the other end of the village by 12 o'clock. You know where he came before. Aye, aye. Well, you must go there and wait till he arrives and watch your opportunity to introduce him across the fields into the little summer house 
on the left side of the garden. That, that's enough. But take particular care that nobody sees you. I warrant you. Nor for your life drop a word of it to any mortal. Never fear and me. And hodge. <laughs> Say no more, sure you told me before. I know the full length of my tether, and my tether. Do you think me a fool that I need go to school? I can spell you and put you together, together. Away to the wise will always suffice. And jiggers go talk to your parrot, your parrot. I'm not such an elf, though I say it myself. I can tell a sheep's head from a parrot, a parrot. <laughs> How severe is my case? Here am I obliged to carry on a clandestine correspondence with a man in all respects my equal because the oddity of my father's temper is such that I dare not tell him I've ever yet seen the man I should like to marry. But perhaps he has quality in his eye and hopes one day or other, as I am his only child, to pair me with the title. Vain imagination. down in the west for a bastard you had by the clerk of the parish and I'll bring the man here shall say it to your face. No, no, Hodge. Tis no such a thing. Tis a base lie of Farmer Plowshares. But I know what makes you false-hearted to me. That you may keep company with young madam's waiting woman and I am sure she's no fit body for a poor man's wife. 
How should you know what she's fit for? She's fit for as much as you may have. Don't find fault with your betters, Madge. Oh, Master Thomas, I have a word or two to say to you. Uh, did not you go down the village one day last week with a basket of, uh, somewhat upon your shoulder? Well, and what of it? Nay, nay, not much. Only the ostler at the Greenman was saying as how there was a passenger at the house and said he'd saw you and said he'd know you and asked him more of questions. So I thought I'd tell you. The devil! Ask questions about me. I know nobody in this part of the country. There must be some mistake in it. Uh, come hither, Hodge. A nasty, ungrateful fellow to use me at this rate, after being to him as I have. Well, well, I wish all poor girls would take heed by my mishap and never have nothing to say to none of them. <laughs> I did not know that my neighbor's estate was so well peopled. Are these all his own tenants? More than are good of them, Master Hawthorne. I would like to see such a parcel of young hussies leering with the fellows. <laughs> now, Your Honor, now the sport will come. The gut scrapers are here, and some among them are going to sing and dance. There's not the likes of our statute run in five counties. Others are but fools to it. Come, good people, make a ring and stand out, fellow servants, as many of you as are willing and able to bear a ball. We'll let my masters and mistresses see we can do something, at least. If they won't hire us, it shan't be our fault. Strike up the servants medley. I wonder if the theater manager could raise the lights so the gentlefolk could sing along. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi, ho, down. Gee, ho, gee, down, and hi.